closest fart station? Civic Center? Yeah, yeah. Civic Center. All right. Well, that's not pressure, right? <laughs> <laughs> You're on candid camera. Yeah, it's not very, it's, it's candid, yeah. Anyway, I can get some good B-roll this way. Alright. Window up's better, right? Either way. You can crack it if you want. But I got... What are you guys filming for? So, I'm doing um, a video about taxis and Uber and Lyft. And, like, how they're different and how they affect each other and stuff like that. Okay. Do you take Uber as well? Uh... I will say I'm actually, I work in the insurance business and both of the companies I work for clients are Uber and Lyft. <laughs> so I, I know they're... Uh, as far as insuring the drivers or...? Um, it's actually for insurance above what the drivers have. In so the event. are you James Rivers Insurance? No. I, no. I work for a broker, so not, uh -huh. necessarily actual the, <clears throat> not necessarily actually the insurer, but the intermediary. Yeah. Between Lyft and the insurer. That's interesting. But yeah, it's it's. So with what you know about insurance, because that's well, that's one of the, the big differences to me. Because I drove Uber and Lyft for eleven months, and then I switched over to taxi. Okay. And one of the things that really concerned me and and uh, caused me a lot of apprehension was the insurance question. I mean, as somebody who handles these types of uh, you know things, do you feel comfortable in a Uber and Lyft car? Knowing, uh, knowing the limitations on insurance. Do you want to yeah. be on camera? <laughs> no, I man. At the end of the day, I think uh, you know. If at the end of the day, the initial cost per se um, is really going to follow the driver, the driver's personal insurance. Um, Unless the personal insurance doesn't cover it. Well, yeah. If the per well, or the personal insurance is exhausted, then I think at that point. The company of Lyft or Uber, that's why they buy insurance to potentially pick up that Delta. So if, if, if you as an Uber or Lyft driver runs a red light and kills two people crossing the crosswalk, at the end of the day, if it goes to trial and, and their family needs to be compensated for the people that died, at the end of the day, your personal insurance is you only buy as much as you buy. And Uber and Lyft, as being a large, somewhat large company, a well-known company, are going to get drawn into the suit, and they're going to have to pay their share, which is why they buy insurance. So they really buy insurance above what. But the that's only that's only now because in the case of Sophia Liu, the girl who was ran over on New Year's Eve a year ago, I mean, she, her family's suing Uber because they can't get any money. I mean, obviously they're having to go do a lawsuit. I mean, if a child dies and they have to take a lawsuit in order to get compensated, I mean, this is obviously a new thing that Uber and Lyft are doing, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. And that's why they buy insurance. So, so like all the other problems that have happened in the past, that just does, that's just not relevant anymore. No, I mean, it's still relevant. I mean, these, you know, Uber and Lyft buy insurance above and beyond what their personal drivers buy at the end of the day. Yeah, but still, there's deductibles. And, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Which is sort of absurd when you think about it. You know, you're, you're driving for a, you know, company and making them, you know, millions of dollars. Millions of dollars, dollars absolutely. And you're going to have to pay Lyft $2,500 if you get in a no-fault accident. And you're going to pay Uber a $1,000 deductible. I mean, I, my personal insurance, which would never cover me during this, um, is $500 deductible. Yeah, your personal insurance, that's the thing that's sticky, is your personal insurance is going to exclude you, you know, providing services for some sort of a fee. So any damages that you cause. But, I mean, again, it's... It's somewhat absurd, though, right? Yeah, no, it you is, can, You can agree that it's absurd. Absolutely. My, my wife, at the, at, towards the end of doing it, she, you know, she just was freaked out every time I'd leave. She goes, what if something was wrong? You know, we're going to have to declare bankruptcy, you know? I mean, you know, you when you're you're doing Lyft and Uber because you're desperate for money. I mean, that's yeah. <laughs> basic, you know. And, you know, I mean, that's why I was doing it. So, you know, I didn't have an extra twenty five hundred dollars, an extra thousand dollars sitting around, you know. And it's my finances are already so extremely tight, you know. So it's, you know, it was scary. No, with, absolutely. With taxi, absolutely. I have nothing to worry about, you know, because I'm completely one hundred percent covered, and passengers are covered, pedestrians are covered. You know, the entire world is covered, so...
Oh, well, I mean, it's cool that you still use taxi because uh, you know. No, I mean, and again, this is a this is a brokerage. I I, I work for PG&E now. For the, I used to work for a large brokerage, but um, no, something to consider. I mean, at the end of the day, if you do something bad, working on Lyft or Uber's dime, they're a large company. They're going to get drawn, and then you're not going to. They're not going to make you go bankrupt before a juror says. You wait. You were driving for Uber and Lyft. I wouldn't Uber trust Lyft's that though. Get drawn in. Absolutely. I wouldn't trust me. Large companies, they're going to make them pay the majority of that cost. If some company sues for ten million dollars, you're not picking that up because one, you don't have that, and two, Uber and Lyft do, and that's why they buy buy the insurance to pick that up. Well, it's quite a gamble, I think. No, it is. But at the end of the day, people know. And a juror, if I try to sue you for ten million, and I know you have. X amount to your name, nowhere near that. But I knew Uber and Lyft, who you were doing business for, had that money. Any but we have yet we have yet to see a case where that's Uber the thing is Lyft there's been no accountable. cases. Well, there's plenty of cases. There's yeah. 27 lawsuits against Uber and Lyft right now worldwide, but not large dollars. Not someone demanding fifty, hundred. How much is? Dollars. Well, I guess Sophia Lou's family is only asking for a million. Well, that's which is pretty insignificant when you think about it yet they're not no. going to break it down because they don't no. want to set that precedent no absolutely and there's no case law i mean there's no it's still early on in the game where who responds the personal insurer the driver's insurer the company's insurer it's so relatively early on but best of luck i don't want to be on camera but <laughs> can i can i use your voice without your face on camera because i never got your face on camera but like this this anonymous voice conversation no that's fine as long as it's not my actual voice if you can like well, I mean, it, it's like... At the end of the day, what happens if one of their drivers causes an accident that hits a van with six people and kills all six? What happens then? What happens? And, and they're deemed the liable. They run a red light or they run a stop sign or they're drunk. Or, I mean, at the end of the day, you buy insurance, but it's you you don't buy $10 million worth of insurance. You buy 100000 worth of insurance, which is not going to cover anything. And so these large companies, that's why these large companies buy insurance is for, because they're a big and because they're a big company and people know they have money, they buy insurance to protect them in the event you cause that accident that kills 10 people, they're going to get drawn into every lawsuit and they know that you only have X amount. The juror's going to say, well, you were driving for Lyft. Lyft is a valuation $2 billion company investors insurance company you should pay their family 10 million dollars and and lyft or uber is going to pick up that cost not you because one you don't have the money to and they're going to go to the deep pocket and the deep pocket has that money but it's got to go to court first it's got to go to, yeah, court gotta go to the, the court jury first. has to determine it no but and once that first jury does then that sets, gonna, yeah it sets a precedent. precedent but at the end of the day if i'm a juror and i'm sitting there and you hit somebody and Maybe you're not even negligent. Just simple lie, lie, like a li uh, negligent. You're you were running. You were going through a regular green light. Someone stepped out in front of you. You hit them. At the end of the day, I'm not going to make you go bankrupt or go in debt for 30 years, and make you pay out of your pocket 750 thousand. I'm going to say, okay, you were working for Lyft. Your insurance only. Your insurance covers the first 100 thousand. Uber or Lyft buys excess insurance on top of their customers' insurance. I'm going to make Uber's insurance or, their, or Uber itself pay the difference. If I'm a juror, that's what I'm going to vote for. Large I would companies. Imagine most well, that, that's what most Sophia would. Lou's attorney is trying to do. Oh, yeah. absolutely, yeah. and they're probably going to win. Yeah, they're going to get once they gonna, get in front of a jury. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So, anyways, gentlemen, take it easy. Have a good night. Take care. You got it. You got everything. Don't forget your bag. Oh, no, that's our no, best. No, that's your you best. got everything. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Don't take our stuff. All right. Cool. Well, you got a fair out of it. <laughs> that was interesting. Right? So how about you tell us how you got into driving for UberX and Lyft anyway? Got laid off from my job in print media. I moved to San Francisco or Oakland as it is. And uh, it's not really much of a demand for a print media specialist anymore. And uh, had a relatively new um, Volkswagen Jetta, and uh, this was about a year ago. And I thought, oh, you know, I'll just check it out, see uh, see what it's like. I mean, I wasn't, you know, I kind of like did the first uh, first weekend, just sort of like, okay, if this this you know, if this if nobody pukes in my car and 
nothing bad happens, then, you know, I'll keep doing it. And uh, nobody peeked in my car, so I kept doing it. At first, I made decent money. You know, it, the, the rates were high enough that, you know, there was money to be made. And, you know, so I, I kept doing it. And then slowly, there became less and less money, more wear and tear on my car. And, uh, you know, the, the, there became cracks in the facade, I guess, you know. So, tell me, like, how did you like doing it? I like driving. I, I've always been, you know, a person who likes to be behind the wheel. I've done lots of road trips. Ever since I got my first car, I saw it as freedom, you know, the ability to be able to you know, do whatever I want, go wherever I want. So I've always been, uh, you know, driving. I've always liked driving from Los Angeles originally. Do a lot of driving down there. And uh, so, you know, I like driving. I like learning the city. I really like geography. You know, it's uh, it was a challenge at first to study it all. And I pinned maps to my wall and, you know, drew maps and, you know, did all these things to, you know, jam the city of San Francisco into my head and uh, I like that you know I like the challenge of that did you like interacting with your passengers oh yeah yeah definitely I definitely like the you know I it's of course something I'm really good at is superficial conversations <laughs> um, you know I, I actually at the end of the day probably prefer them you know because I like to be able to recreate myself every time and that's what I did you know with each passage that came in my car I just recreated a whole persona and you know you know worked off of their persona and you know just uh, you know had fun with it and uh, yeah. so yeah well what were, were what were the things that led you to decide to become a cab driver instead well that was sort of a long time you know, coming, I'd kind of probably, after a few months of doing Lyft, that I started doing Uber as well. And after doing Uber and sort of feeling more like a cab driver, like at first it was sort of repulsive, the idea of people just getting in my backseat, telling me where to go and ignoring me. You know, with, with Lyft, especially early on, it was so many social aspects to it. I mean, it's completely different to what it is now. Just completely different. In the beginning, it was like everybody did sit up front. Nobody sat in the back. Everybody sat up front. There was fist bumps. I didn't initiate any fist bump, but lots of passengers did. There was a, uh, you know, it was, you felt like you were actually, you know, hanging out with people and doing things and making friends. And, you know, it seemed kind of cool. It was sort of unique. But then when I started to do Uber, uh, you know, at first I, I didn't like that part of it where it was more like a traditional taxi experience but then Lyft started to change and you know it just you know Lyft, the whole idea of Lyft and I think this happens to everybody in fact I was just communicating with the driver today a Lyft driver who has a personalized Lyft license plate and uh, he's a driver in San Diego and uh, he's, he has pictures on his Twitter of him and John Zimmer has pictures of him with the mustache, the mustache on his face, it shows him with all these meetups where they have, and he was upset because he'd been deactivated. Lyft had essentially fired him without any reason why. So he was on Twitter complaining about this, and I, and I you know, I tweeted him and said, you know what, do you know what happened? He doesn't know. He's outraged because he believed in this company so much that he invested in this personalized license plate and you know all his time and energy into doing this and they just deactivate him because some passenger said something the closest thing he has to a reason is allegations so a passenger had said something and lift took their side and deactivated him he's devastated and early on I began to see this happen. You know, this is not new. This has been going on as long as I've been around Lyft. And Lyft has this sort of image in the media as being the fun, quirky, non-Uber, the anti-Uber, but they're just as evil as Uber. And if not more, I've always felt like Lyft was definitely more Uber than, than uh, more evil than Uber because 
they, they're pretending not to be. You know, Uber doesn't pretend to be anything but this cutthroat, scrappy startup that's gonna like take over the world. Even the name implies that. Lyft is like, you know, trying to be, you know, this quirky thing, but they're, they're, they're just a money-making operation as well. They're just using this alleged community, you know, thing to go along with it. So the whole time I've been involved with, with Lyft and, you know, their Facebook page and all this other bullshit, I, I began to see these people who, who kind of like believed in it so much and then, you know, where, you know, something happened and they, you know, all of a sudden became devastated. It was like, you know, people in Scientology or, or people in a, you know, a church or in a cult, all of a sudden, you know, losing that, that, that fantasy of what it is and then just being horrified by it. And I started to document it, you know, and, and I've kind of done that, you know, for the past, you know, since June of last year, I've been documenting, you know, the cult of lift with your blog with my blog and with the zines that i do you know it's uh you know and um so you know at, at the end of the day i was doing lift and uber and i kind of warmed up to the idea of having passengers in the back seat telling me where to go and that was the extent of it you know so i you know i kind of decided well maybe i need to you know drive a taxi and that's kind of where I made that decision and I guess I just talked about it so much that you know I knew I had to do it because I couldn't keep uh you know saying I'm gonna drive a taxi and not doing it so I talked about it for a really long time well why I mean what's the benefit of driving a taxi well I mean there's the insurance question I mean that guy's back there it's like do I want to be a guinea pig you know I mean, that's what he's basically saying, right? He was saying, well, you know, eventually a jury is going to make this decision. Well, until then, you know, Sophia Lou's family is still, you know, out a child. I mean, what, what kind of price do you put on human life, you know? Roberto Chicas is still having surgeries for his eye. I mean, at night, I drive lots of bartenders, and they all know him. He was, a, you know, sort of part of the fabric of the, the bar life in San Francisco. You know, so he's still, you know, he's still going to potentially lose his eye. And, you know, these are the two big ones that really stand out to me. They're the rapes, the assaults, the, all these other things. And it's like, the, one day maybe, you know, there will be justice for all that. But who wants to be the test subject? Who wants to be the guinea pig? And with, with Taxi, there's no, there's no sense of that. I don't feel unsafe. I feel like there's established rules and regulations and you know there's you know I mean plus I make more money you know 30% you know average on tips is pretty normal for a taxi driver right so you you feel you make more money as a taxi driver oh, than definitely, definitely. like I was saying earlier you know I, I guess you know it wasn't on camera but the only way you're going to make money driving for Lyft and Uber is to scam the system you can go on to these websites, these blogs for drivers who have YouTube videos and detailed examples of how to scan the system, how to make it surge, how to only drive when it's surging, how to do these, these uh, you know, various tactics. And I'm just not, you know, good at doing things like that because I would drive, you know, normally and just do my thing, you know, accept my rides, pick people up, and I wasn't making any money. And, you know, I wasn't making what I, what I did when I started. I wasn't making enough to survive. Do you mind saying how much you made when you started and then how much you made after the price cuts? So I started off about eight to 800 to 1,000 a week before expenses. That doesn't include expenses. I'm not uh, mathematically savvy enough to be able to, you know, calculate how much I actually made and didn't make for, you know, versus expenses. And was that before they took their percentage? Or? Yeah. Uh -huh. No, that was, that was after. That uh -huh. was like take home. So right. my deposits into my bank, I was, you know, averaging 800 to a thousand dollars a week. Working how many days? Four or five days, uh -huh. you know, 30, 30 hours a week, mm -hmm. 35 hours a week. And, uh, you know, mostly, you know, weekends. I started off doing weeks, but then started realizing that the, you know, you made you made really good money on the weekends, and I would drive till three in the morning. And yeah, I'd make the money, and then 
after the price cuts it, it started there was so many price cuts you know it, it didn't they didn't just drop it all of a sudden it just became to sort of trickle down loss of income to where I was making 600 a week and I was making 500 a week and I was making 400 a week and I started driving less and because I started seeing it, it was worth it and I didn't have anything else to sort of take fill up the the gap of that so I mean you could say you know technically that you know had I worked more I probably could have you know increased my earnings but there was no incentive to do it there were so many drivers it wasn't surging and I just began to sort of hate it you know and hate doing it, it felt very unsafe and vulnerable I had a few situations where I've had you know girls pass out of my car I've had girls so drunk they don't know where they live anymore and I you know spend 45 minutes in the sunset looking for this girl's apartment one night uh, you know I had a wrong passenger pass out of my car you know once and you know I try to contact Lyft or Uber and there was just no way there's nothing you know and the situation was there. It was like, oh my God, I have this half naked girl passed out of my car. I don't know who she is. She's not the person that was supposed to be in my car because that person just called me and asked me where I was, you know? So I'm having to deal with these things and it's like, my God, you know? How, how unsafe are we? You know, this is not safe. This does not make sense in any reasonable way, you know? So then I, I began to pursue taxi. And, you know, it was intimidating at first. There was a lot of stuff that, I, you know, you have to do to be a taxi driver. And that, that was, you know, kind of scary at first. That, you know, I was gonna have to go to taxi school. <clears throat> I was gonna have to, you know, fingerprints, get with that, you know, do the MTA. It was a slow process, you know. And, and it, you know, it cost a couple hundred bucks, I guess, at the end of the day. And, uh, you know, when you're running a slim margin, you know, coming up with a couple hundred extra bucks, you know, it's hard, especially when you're starting to, you know, resist the, you know, driving for the, you know, out of fear. So, you know, I started making less with Lyft and Uber. So I guess at the end of the day, if you're the type of person that doesn't care about insurance gaps or insurance concerns and you're willing to throw caution to the wind, you don't have a problem taking advantage of people and with surge pricing, which I was always felt guilty about, um, if, if you're cool with figuring out a way to, to work the system, to work the app, to make it, you know, surge when you want it to, or how to only drive when it's surging, how to figure out all these things. And I guess what a taxi driver told me once, that's called chasing the money. You know, it's like a successful taxi driver doesn't chase the money. And that's what they're doing, you know? And, uh, if you're, if, I mean, if you're cool with that, then, then you can do lift <laughs> I'm not cool with that. I just want to do my job drive, pick people up, take them where they're going, be friendly, be nice, you know. Do you, do you think, um, do you think the rating system was fair? Or like, what was your rating? And then do you, do you think it was fair? My, my rating was, was 4.9 with both, you know, um, I, um, you know, I, like I said, I learned the, I learned the city really fast and would generally be able to get people where they're going without, you know, having to mess around with the app or anything like that. It would just be like, and a lot of people were, were impressed by that, you know. It was sort of uncommon for a, for a Lyft and Uber driver to know where they're going. So, you know, that I think that got me higher ratings, but I also kept my mouth shut. You know, I never talked about anything that was honest. I never, you know, tried to be, you know, who I actually was as a human being. I lived in fear of negative ratings when somebody got in my car and it's just like they seemed unhappy. I mean, I'm not going to lie and say that the rating system didn't hang over my head like a black cloud constantly. Because um, it did. It was, you know, the, the great thing about driving a taxi is that, you know, besides flywheel, and, and I think most people are using flywheel and not trying to be trigger happy with the rating. But when you're driving somebody and you're doing your job, and, you know, there, there should be no points or merits or gold stars or anything involved in that. It's just, I'm taking you from point A to point B, and I'm doing it in the most efficient way possible that I know possible. If you know a better way, tell me. We do. We work it out. Um, 
you know, that's all, that's the end of the transaction. I mean, that's the beautiful thing about taxi is that when the ride is over with, they're out of the car and we're done with each other, you know? I always make sure, I go, did you leave anything? <laughs> I always look in the back, you know? And, uh, you know, because I just want it to be done, you know? That's, we don't need to, you know, to have some sort of lingering, you know, satisfaction rating to go along with that. Is this not, this isn't, you know, some sort of transaction that requires that. I know they say that the rating is for, you know, to protect people, but I mean, I just don't see that really protecting people. I see it just as a way that, that drivers are able to, you know, ex take out their frustration on passengers. Because on Uber, the ratings are horrible. I mean, it's funny. I, I did do a blog post about it, you know, but the Lyft passengers always have like 4.9 or 5. But Uber passengers always have like 4.6, 4.7, you know. It's because the drivers are rating them low for the hell of it. I mean, I've seen people on Facebook groups say it doesn't matter what that passenger did, how they acted, how friendly they were, anything. They're getting three stars because fuck them. That's how Uber drivers, you know, talk. And, you know, that's what they... So you see that in the ratings, you know. It's kind of funny how, you know, how the rating system works, you know. And passengers will... I, I did, you know, one night, one of the last few nights I drove Uber, I think I did three rides, and my rating the next day was, like, three. So somebody gave me, like, two stars or something. And I was, like, going at three rides. I knew each one went flawless. They're perfect. There's not a single issue. Drove exactly where. I never even asked how to get there. It was, like, I know, right, where you take you, you know? And somebody just, you know, on a power trip. So, like, this guy who was driving the Lyft, and he was this, this huge Lyft fanatic, and he was really loyal to the company and he gets deactivated because something a passenger said and that's the rating system for you you know it doesn't matter how well a job you do anybody on a power trip can get you fired 301 what's the mta going to do <clears throat> they're going to bring you in and they're going to hear your side of it they're going to say well let's let's talk about this and that's how normal people behave in a reasonable world do you do you think that um Uber and X and Lyft need to be regulated more? Oh my God. Not only do they need to be regulated more, they, I think they should all be TCPs. They should all be regulated as, you know, livery. You know, that's what they are. They're, they're functioning as, uh, you know, under limo clause. Uh, they, so they should all have, you know, commercial licenses, TCP regulated, you know, on their car, in, in commercial insurance. And they, of course, they, which they would never be able to pick up passengers, you know, from street hails. And they sure as hell should never be able to use taxi lanes. <laughs> you know, since I started driving taxi, there's nothing more infuriating than to see an Uber car in a taxi lane. It's like, you know, that is mine, you know, that belongs to taxi cabs. That is one of the things that we have that helps us transport people around the city. So, you know, it's like they're, they're just, you know, they're, they're just cheating the system and they know they're cheating it. You know, that's why they never tell their insurance companies, you know, that what they're doing because they know they're cheating. It's, you know, it's like, you know, it's like you're either going to admit, you're going to admit you're a cheater or you're going to pretend like, well, I'm not cheating because Liv told me I wasn't, you know? So, you know, it's like, that's, that's the, the um, you know, that's the point you get into. It's like, are you, you know, going to admit you're cheating or are you going to, like, you know, pretend, you know, plead ignorance, you know? So, yeah, I guess we're going back to my place and it's it's been almost an hour, so, I mean, we can just wind it down. Um, yeah, I appreciate your time and everything. Um, uh, can you maybe talk about the insurance gap? Because that seems to be the a big deal. Yeah. Okay, so, I and mean, we had the guy... You know, I mean, that's just just funny that the guy would would get into the would get into the car that worked with that. Um, you know, I mean, like I said, it's you know the way he talked about it. It's like you're going to be a guinea pig, and who wants to be a guinea pig for an insurance, you know, thing? I, I mean, well, did you when you were driving your your Volkswagen? Did you you couldn't tell your insurance, right? No. So, so maybe elabor elaborate on that. Maybe. Well, regardless of what he said, I was going up Connecticut Trail Hill one day, and this Mercedes Benz, Mercedes Benz turned the corner 
and so quickly and so aggressively, I just closed my eyes. I, I anticipated the collision. I, I had nowhere to turn right to. There are cars on my right. I, I mean, there's just, it was one of those, those instances where you just know you're gonna get hit. And somehow she managed to swerve out of the way. And I mean, you know, even the cars behind me were like, holy crap, that was close. And what went through my head was not, you know, my safety, you know, it was the fact that she could tell her insurance company that I had a lift placard in my window. So I was on my way to pick somebody up. So my app was initiated. She could tell her insurance company, well, this guy was driving Lyft. He was doing commercial activity. And her insurance company, because of, you know what that guy says. I mean, their insurance company, I, I was, I've been in accidents before with my own insurance and they have done everything they could to not pay me. So what is gonna stop her insurance agency from going, we're not gonna pay this because he was doing commercial activity and breaking the law. And then Lyft is gonna be like, well, you didn't have a passenger in the car and you were only in this one partial coverage, so we'll fix your car, but you gotta give us a $2,500 deductible. My insurance, of course, would drop me in a heartbeat if I were to tell them about that. That what, that I got in an accident and you know I would either have to lie, figure out a way and hope that I don't get caught um, you know, and if that, I mean, I just thought about that and I told my wife what happened. She goes, you know, you know, we would have had to have declared bankruptcy for that. That's because the, the thin margin that you're driving on. When you see people driving their BMWs and Mercedes and Audis doing Uber, they're so desperate. That's because they're desperate. It isn't because they're out trying to you know, help humanity or they have some vendetta against taxis, you know, <laughs> they're doing it because they're desperate for money and they're not thinking about the consequences. Is it, is it the kind of, the, is it pretty much the MO? I mean, we know it is, but maybe you can just kind of elaborate for camera that the, the Lyft and Uber drivers, UberX and Lyft drivers, they have to keep that a secret from their insurance companies. Of course they do. I mean, you know, it's like you've seen, I mean, I, I've seen, you know, you know, where they ask questions on Facebook groups, have you told your insurance? I, I've even seen people try to do like a, a rated quiz where you can like, you know, whatever. It's just, uh, this is something everybody's been talking about forever. And the general consensus, and I believe it's up to like 92% or 95% of Lyft and Uber drivers do not tell their insurance company because they know that if they do, they will lose their coverage. I mean, it's in the, it's in your contract that you cannot do commercial activity. So you know, people who are very pro TNC, pro Uber and Lyft, they're hoping that insurance companies will come up with this hybrid insurance that will cover them while they're doing it. So I mean, that, again, that, what doesn't make sense to me is if you are working to make a company billions of dollars, why are you then gonna you know pay for the insurance? You know, because they're setting the rates, you know, I mean, it's just, it's so circular. Everything is so connected with this. It's like this giant, absurd melodrama, you know, and, and the insurance question is the, is the big one because that's really where they're breaking the law. California, the state of California said you can do your commercial activity as Lyft and Uber and call it a TNC. And so they're not breaking the law with that, but they are breaking the law with the insurance because they're committing insurance fraud. I mean, plain and simple, right? Do you, have you ever, or do you know any TNC drivers who ever picked up street flags for cash? <sighs> no, but I've been, I've had Uber black drivers. I've ha I had an Uber black driver pull up to me on Lumbar one day when I was smoking a cigarette and said, taxi? And I was like, I drive Uber X. He goes, oh, and sped away. I've seen, you know, Uber black drivers solicit people on the street. Um, have I, I've, I've never seen an Uber X driver or a Lyft driver pick somebody up. Although one night driving taxi, there was this weird situation in Union Square and I don't know what was going on, but there was a Lyft driver and somebody hailed me and then they got in the car and there's, they were talking to the Lyft driver and I couldn't tell whether he, what he was trying to do, but it was definitely weird. And, uh, you know, so I don't know what they're going on, but I personally haven't seen Cool. Anything else? I don't know. 
always seems like there's so much more. So yeah. Much, there's so much more to say about this. Yeah. Uh. But, um, yeah. I mean, I prefer driving a taxi. It's, uh, it's just a much better experience for me, you know? And I think that one of the things that, that intimidated me about it was not knowing what's involved in driving a taxi as far as going to school, going to taxi school. Yeah, you spend four days, nine to five, going to taxi school. My taxi teacher had me, you know, do, had us do homework every night, you know? And, uh, you know, but uh, it wasn't that bad, you know? It just wasn't that bad.